to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between two students talking about driving lessons. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi Zach, I heard you passed your driving test. Congratulations! Thanks Olivia, I passed just last week. It feels great to be independent and driving on my own. I really want to take driving lessons but I haven't been able to find a driving school that will give lessons during the weekends so that I don't have to miss any classes at college. The woman wants to take driving lessons during the weekends. So, weekends has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Zach, I heard you passed your driving test. Congratulations! Thanks Olivia, I passed just last week. It feels great to be independent and driving on my own. I really want to take driving lessons, but I haven't been able to find a driving school that will give lessons during the weekends so that I don't have to miss any classes at college. The driving school that I used was brilliant and really flexible with their teaching hours. It's really close to the school. The address is 67 Kings Road. That's 67 King, apostrophe S, Road. Oh, that's perfect. I don't like the idea of driving around busy streets. Did your teacher make you drive in urban areas? Or did he mainly teach you on roads in the countryside? My teacher said that I had to learn on both in order to become a good and experienced driver. We would start in the city centre and then drive north above the city. He sounds like a good teacher. Would you mind giving me his contact details so I can ask him for lessons? Of course. My mother's friend Daniel Smith referred me to him. His name is Alan Sutcliffe. Could you spell the surname, please? S-U-T-C-L-I-F-F-E Thanks for helping me out. I'll give him a call tomorrow. I don't know if I should learn in a manual or automatic car. How do I decide? I wasn't sure which type of car to learn in either. In the end, I chose to learn in a manual car because once you've learnt how to drive manually, you can drive automatic as well. Most cars on the road are automatic nowadays. OK, I think I'll learn with a manual car too then. Hopefully the teacher will be able to give me lessons in the evenings after school. It would be much better if you take the lessons during the day. It will be far easier for you to learn when there is enough daylight to clearly see everything going on around you. But you need to be an experienced driver to drive safely at night. How frustrating. I was hoping I wouldn't have to take lessons during the weekends. You're right though, safety comes first. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Speaking of safety, you should wait until summer to start learning. 
It's really difficult and dangerous to drive in the wind and rain as a learner, so you should definitely wait until the weather is sunny and dry. OK, a y that's perfect, actually. It will give me some time to save up some money to pay for the lessons. Tell me about it. I had to work for months before I had enough money saved up. It was worth all the work when I finally got my driving l i c e n s e though. The whole process is so expensive. How much did it cost you in the end? Well, each half hour lesson cost $30, and then the final test cost $50. In total, it cost me about $300. Gosh, it's pretty expensive. How did you find the test? Was it really difficult? No, it wasn't too bad, and the man was really calm and friendly. I knew that I would have to perform two parking manoeuvres during the test, so I practiced them a lot beforehand, and that really helped. The test used to last 40 minutes, but it changed a bit. For the first 20 minutes of the test, he gave me directions, and I had to just drive around, and then the last 10 minutes was for demonstrating the manoeuvres. So the test is 30 minutes in total. OK, a y great, I'll remember that. Do you have any more advice? It's really good to practice driving a lot outside of driving lessons as well. Whenever my parents were running errands on the weekends, I would offer to drive them. My driving teacher also told me to buy a notebook to write down everything that I've learnt in it, like a diary. Ha <laughs> ha, that sounds boring, but I'll do it if it helps. I found it really useful. Before my test, I read through everything I had written down and it reminded me of a lot of things that I had forgotten about. It's really helpful for the theory test as well because there's so much information to remember for it. That's great, Zach. Thanks for your help. No problem. See you at school. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. Now, here you all are, new university students. And the first question you probably have is, what is a student union? Another question is, do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded, so, joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join, since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. 
We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left, and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints, and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question: What are we? We are a formal organization, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises, and organize ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well, the student union organized all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking, and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions, and as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now let me tell you more about the student union and its basic functions. In general, there are three: social, organizational, and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear. In other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to twenty percent discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper, and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right, let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue. If you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counselors and helpers, and even some lawyers who you can meet in the conference room. So just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 3. You will hear a discussion between a business student called Marco and his personal tutor about the courses that Marco should take. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Marco. Come in. Thanks. I've got a bit stuck trying to select courses for next semester. Could you help me, please? Of course. Sit down. Oh. First of all, most people just go for the areas of business that they're interested in. But even if something doesn't look very stimulating... It's important that you can use it once you get a job. It's not much good choosing areas that aren't going to be helpful later on. Right. I want to go into management, so I'll need to think about that. And should I start specialising in a particular area yet? I don't think that's wise at this stage. It's better to aim for a wide variety of subjects, especially as management covers so many possibilities. You shouldn't be limiting your choices for later on. Yes, I see. You should also look at how the course is made up. Will you have regular seminars and tutorials, for example, as well as lectures? OK. Some of the lecturers are quite big names in their fields, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Should I aim to go to their courses? Well, remember that the lecturers who aren't well-known may still be very good teachers... I'd say we have a consistently high standard of teaching in this department, so you don't need to worry about it. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30 on pages 5 and 6. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Good. Well, that's a great help. Now, last time we met, you mentioned doing team management, didn't you? That's right. I'm still quite keen on the idea. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that because of changes in the content of various courses, team management overlaps with the Introduction to Management course you took in your first year. Oh. So what you'd learn from it would be too little for the amount of time you'd have to spend on it. I'll drop that idea, then. Have you had a chance to look at the outline I wrote for my finance dissertation? I left it in your pigeonhole last week. Yes. Why exactly do you want to write a dissertation instead of taking the finance modules? It'll be pretty demanding. Well, I'm quite prepared to do the extra work because I'm keen to investigate something in depth instead of just skating across the surface. I realise that a broader knowledge base may be more useful to my career, but I'm really keen to do this. Hmm, right. Well, I had a quick look through your outline, and the first thing that struck me was that you'll have to be careful how you set about it, as the way you've organised it seems unnecessarily complex. The data that you want to collect and analyse is potentially valuable, but you'll need to narrow down the subject matter to make the whole thing manageable. OK. I'll have another look at it. I was talking to Professor Briggs about it yesterday, and I got some more ideas then. For part of the dissertation, I was thinking of trying to persuade finance managers from three or four companies to let me ask them about their company finances. Mm -hmm. If not, I think I'll have to change to another topic. Well, go ahead then. I could give you some names. Thanks. Now, let's talk about practicalities. 
Your dissertation must be finalised by the end of May, so you should aim to finish the first draft by the end of March. Is that feasible? Yes, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll need to register for the dissertation, won't I? Is that with the registrar's department? No, it's internal to this department, so you just need to let the secretary know. Do that as soon as you're sure you're going to write the dissertation. Okay. Then to analyse your statistics, you're going to need some suitable software. If I were you, I'd drop into the computer office and ask them for a copy. Right. So if I revise my outline. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on seasonal affective disorder. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the past few years, a new condition has been identified and given a name, SAD, short for Seasonal Affective Disorder. This is now recognised as a distinct kind of clinical depression, where people become depressed at the onset of winter, accompanied by a craving for sweet things, causing weight gain. Each spring and summer would then bring on almost maniacal highs and feelings of boundless energy and happiness. Experiments to combat this depression showed that increased exposure to bright light in humans could suppress their production of a darkness-related hormone called melatonin. The light needed to induce this change was about 2,000 lux, or about four times brighter than ordinary household lighting. It was then calculated that if bright light could suppress melatonin secretion, then it might have other effects on the brain, including the reversal of symptoms of depression. While melatonin's precise role in SAD has not been pinned down, the theory led to effective treatment. Not surprisingly, SAD affects more people where winter nights are longer and days shorter. In the UK, an estimated half a million adults develop a full-blown SAD in winter and twice this number suffer the milder condition called sub-syndromal SAD. About 80% of sufferers improve when given light therapy and improvement usually comes within two to four days. Scientists are still unsure why winter depression happens but more than a decade of research has turned up some surprising findings. Nearly 80% of SAD victims are women. Researchers are uncertain why this is so. SAD can affect people at any age, but typically it begins around the age of 20 and becomes less common between 40 and 50. SAD is comparatively rare in children and adolescents, but so far researchers have been unable to come up with a logical reason for this. As many as half of sad sufferers have at least one family member with depressive illness, suggesting that the depression has a genetic component. Some patients experience shifts in their body clocks when they're depressed in winter. They are morning people at one time of the year and become evening people at another. What is the underlying difference between sad sufferers and others? A clue can be found in carbohydrate craving, a common symptom. People often become obsessed with chocolate, for example. Carbohydrates alter brain chemistry by increasing the level of a soothing chemical called serotonin, a neurotransmitter that carries signals between brain cells. 
Sad sufferers crave carbohydrates because they may need serotonin to lift their mood. This craving can be intense, in fact, an addiction. It may be that the serotonin system of the brain has problems regulating itself during the winter. Some sad sufferers respond well to the drug Prozac, thought to influence the brain's serotonin using system. Other brain chemicals and hormones probably play a role in winter depression. Another neurotransmitter, dopamine, for example, may be inadequate in certain cases. Researchers hope to uncover clues to sad secret by probing similarities between sad and hibernation. Though no valid link between the two has been established, some sad patients say they feel like hibernating animals. Sad sufferers tend to put on fat in autumn and early winter, roughly the time when such hibernators as bears and squirrels do. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.